Um, so I get to introduce our next keynote speaker, Carol. Uh, gosh, I don't know where my 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 brain went, but all of a sudden, Alden. I was going to say Anderson, and I knew that wasn't right. So I'm glad I loved it. But uh, Carol and I actually talked this week on the phone for about an hour and a half, and we both have roots. She she is a, a Utah. Uh, I don't, not a native, I guess, because you're no. a <laughs> We both have uh, roots in Utah. I was actually born in, in Utah uh, and, uh, and uh, was part of that whole culture for many years, although I've long since abandoned it, but uh, <laughs> to, to a great degree, actually. But, um, but so we have had so much in common that our, I, I mean, anything that I would say about her would be something I'd be saying about myself, actually. I mean, from our opinions on uh, Mormonism to many other things. So uh, anyway, so um, and actually, as she as she talks, she will reveal all of the personal things that I would have said, because I've heard her talk recently myself, and I know she does that. She sees one of her images. Carol is an artist, and she was an artist before she even went to prison. So um, I was really impressed, though, when I was reading your uh, artist statement, which I found on the Justice uh, uh Justice Arts Coalition, uh, with whom you have a relationship. And I read that. And I was really impressed or depressed, I'm not sure which, by the fact that to do art in prison, you had to get written permission. You had to like apply and get written permission for the forms you could use. I mean, yep. from the supplies down to, so you might, you know, include some discussion of that. I think that's appalling. If you're creative, that should be innate to who you are and you should be allowed it. I mean, it's just, uh, so um, I don't think our artists have to do that in Arizona. That's just crazy, crazy. Um, but anyway, um, you have so many things to talk about. And I, I do have to tell you, if you came in recently, um, and I've, I've you, many of you've heard this now about six times, but our 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 current peace president had a death in the family last night, oh, and so our, our technicalities are a little bit rough um, because uh, Nala and I are filling in on that, but we're um, I'm not very good at it to be honest, and, and and Leslie had it all worked out, and she she had this down to a little science. So I'm going to now have to trade over to the slides presentation. And and these are, Lance, this is what she would have shown during your presentation, but you got we got to see you, so we really didn't need it. And we get to see Carol face-to-face. -face. So I'm just gonna, oh, wow, how do I, oh, I have to figure out, I have to, tell me, I don't, see, I always use PowerPoint. I don't use Google Slides. Somebody, Grace, you told me what to do, didn't you? Um, you share your screen. Okay, share my screen, and then I go to uh, present, I guess. All right, so now I need to, okay, so that's where we have that. And then I click in it, and we're not having that break, and we're not ha doing the panel. We've already done the panel. Here's Carol. Now, I don't know what or exact order that we were up last, late last night before <laughs> she got the text about her grandmother dying. Uh, uh, working on yeah, it's it's always untimely when someone dies, and yet it's the right time because it's happened. So you have to adjust to that. Yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, we'll see. We'll see, uh, Carol, what comes <laughs> what, up. What, next. Whatever comes up, I'll explain it. <laughs> okay, this was your sort of order, and she put that, that's what we were working on. But uh, why don't you do this? I mean, I love the. Uh, 13 years in prison couldn't take the art out of you because you were an artist beforehand. So hear your screen. Oh, I still have to do that. Sorry. 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 Um, thank you, uh, Nala. That's what I'm saying. Uh, you wouldn't have had these little snafus if, if uh, Leslie were here with us, but uh, she's not. So we're going to make do and wish her good vibes. Okay. Is it now sharing? Yes. Oh, but now I have to do the the view again of the present. Now you should just see the slide. Is that right? Yes, that's what we see. Okay, and you don't even see your picture over on the side, right? That's just what I'm looking at. Yeah, I'm just I'm seeing you and I'm seeing the slide. Okay. All right. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to put myself out of the way there a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so 
um, you might tell us about this. Ignore the words because the re that was what you're from your email to us. And we hope we got it close to what you wanted. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know, I have, I have to, I had to laugh when you were talking about uh, the technology curve there because, you know, I was down for 13 years, but I wasn't really connected to technology prior to that either. I was kind of a hermit out in the desert, and uh, you know, somewhere I've got a VCR that's probably still blinking 12. Uh, <laughs> so this is. You know, I probably aggravated the beans out of everybody who's tried to work with me to put this together and any other presentation oh, yeah. because half the time I delete my portfolio when I think I'm, you know, just putting it somewhere else. So if you got anything from me at all, that's a plus. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this, I think this, this picture that's is up was taken for the muse um article in uh, utah right well it, it was probably it was within the first year that i was out and uh, they came and kind of followed me around for a little bit and looked at this project that i was doing i um you know we talk about housing issues when you're getting out and if if you've committed a crime that involves a death in Utah, it kind of puts you on the same footing as a sex offender, which means nobody has to rent to you. And I made over 300 phone calls trying to find a place to live mm. when uh, I found out I was getting out. And it was an unexpected. I thought I was doing my whole 15 years. And the legislature did an audit and found that there were about a thousand cases that the facts of the case did not match the sentencing. And that I should have, they sent me paperwork saying I should have been released um, like August 23rd of 2011, mm -hmm. which was eight years before I actually got released. So I wasn't prepared. You know, I was thinking I had a few more years to get ready to figure out what I was going to do when I got out. And all of a sudden, a caseworker calls and says, so uh, do you have any place to go? Because you're being released in two weeks. And I didn't have any place to go. And I made over 300 phone calls and everybody denied me on the basis of my crime, which was second degree manslaughter. And it was a self-defense issue in uh, a domestic violence situation. But, um, you know, I finally did parole to my daughter's house briefly, but I still, you know, how do you, how do you afford a place to live when you can't even get a job or you don't have transportation or there's all kinds of barriers to getting your ID? It took me three months to get a proper ID so I could even open a bank account. And I decided that I needed to have kind of a mobile uh, living situation. And so I had taken money that I earned from um, an art exhibit that the state put on and I'd won best of show. And then they purchased the piece for uh, their permanent collection. And so this article was kind of, kind of revolved around that and how I had taken that money and I bought an old RV and I was trying to turn it into a studio that I could travel in and, and uh, teach classes and just be kind of self-contained. Okay. So, and that RV will come up somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Is this desert cradle? I don't know no. why she puts these in the <laughs> desert cradle. Desert cradle means the place, right? It's the cradle of creativity. It's well, like no. the ancient Mesopotamia. <laughs> yes, yes. I was I was alive back then. Um, Desert Cradle is actually the title of the first kind of political piece that I did ah. back, back in the 90s. And it was very controversial. It was a, um, I built a cradle out of components of Southern Utah. Ah. So it had the Red Rock cliffs and um beaver tail cactus in bloom and there were there's a mojave rattlesnake and and different kinds of lizards and and sphinx moths and and 
it went to the uh, National Museum for Women in the Arts in oh. Washington, D.C. to oh. represent as one of about 100 pieces that went to went there to represent the state of Utah. And it was called Utah Women Out of the Land. Well, there was a group of women from BYU that mounted a campaign to have my piece yanked out of the show. They had um, a, oh, they had a picket line. <laughs> they had, oh my gosh. <laughs> they had petitions for people to send to the governor. They gave speeches. Um, now they didn't know who I was really. Um, I went to their rally. And I sat in the back and at one point when they were frothing at the mouth about how they didn't want somebody as immoral as myself representing the good women of Utah, I raised my hand and asked if I could address the group. And of course, they assumed that the only people there were the people who agreed with them. And so when I said, my name is, <laughs> you know, you could her drop. Everybody turned around in their chairs and gawked at me. And I said, you know, this piece is a metaphor. And if you had taken the time to read the artist's statement about the piece, you would have realized that I am celebrating women's lives and the fact that we go through a lot of harsh things. You know, the desert is a harsh place. It's hard to stay alive in the desert. It's hard to bloom and be creative. And yet nature does it. And women are the same way. They experience abuse, poverty, um, you know, any, any number of, of tragedies and barriers and whatnot to being sane and healthy and safe. And yet they thrive and they create beauty and they bring life into the world and they do, you know, they do their best. So, but they had publicly stated that I had made a piece of artwork that was um, anti-motherhood and pro-abortion. <laughs> because it was, it had ugly snakes on it and it was empty, that there was not a baby in the cradle. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, how many people, how many of you have cradles at home that are, not, that are full, you know, 24 seven? Pretty sure there's a few in the attic kicking around, you know, they're not always full. You know, you wait for babies, babies grow up, all kinds of things happen. So, you know, they ended up issuing a public apology, but in the meantime, you know, there were newspaper articles coming out internationally. This is back when everything was, you know, in print. <laughs> and, and the state actually ended up purchasing that piece for their permanent museum collection. Um, <laughs> so that was my first foray with kind of, you know, some political consciousness other than just doing things that were you know, interested me or were whimsical and fun. And because to me, you know, to be a successful artist was when I had things out in public and it's like, no matter how tired people were when they're dragging through an arts festival, you know, some little kid would grab their mom's hand and they'd be like, mom, 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 mom. <laughs> and they'd turn around and look and it would just be like, you know, they were just delighted. And that memory would stay with them for the rest of their lives. And then they're interested in the process and they come over and they, you know, they want to touch things. And it's, and I always let children touch my work. You know, if I have to wash it off, hose it off or repaint it or something, fine. You know, I don't care. It's more important that they have an, ex that they have that experience of, you know, getting up close and personal and feeling it and seeing that somebody like them made this. And so they could learn how to make something like this. You know, if they're really fascinated in something, they can do it. So that was kind of my perspective on, on artwork back then. I, you know, there really wasn't anything that I was terribly pissed off about at the time. I, you know, I was, had kids, I had my animals, things were going well, you know, so everything was just kind of fun. Things changed when I went to prison, obviously. Yeah. But these pictures that you're seeing right now, those are actually um, small drawings that are going to be part of a fundraiser for um, the resources that we need for building this fish house um, that's going to be a place for um, workshops for women that have undergone trauma. And, you know, and it might not always be just for women, but right now, you know, I'm dealing with the kind of trauma that I know. 
-hmm. and so you know eventually the the originals will will be up for the fundraiser but in the meantime um we're going to be offering prints uh, of all these of these things and i've been drawing these while i sit at my greeter position at a grocery store mm. so that was the only place that would hire me <laughs> and so i get to sit at the front door and be chastised about whether or not we have to wear masks or, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. So it's been very, very, very interesting to go from being in prison and feeling very antisocial and not wanting to be around people to all of a sudden being stuck right there in the front of the store going, hi, <laughs> you know, welcome to Harmon's. How are you today? <laughs> so... Anyway, well, these are so uplifting. You can't help but smile at them, except for those teeth. Those teeth are just <laughs> downright scary. It's like they're going to eat your heart, right? Yeah, it it's like you lure them in with love and then you eat them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so well, they're, they're patterned after uh, the deep sea fish, you know, like the, the angler fish down in the Oh gosh, they're down in like the Mariana Trench. They're in some of the, the deepest areas. And, and there again, this particular kind of fish is kind of an ongoing theme just because they thrive and survive in areas where there's so much pressure that hardly anything else can. Yeah. Wow. And there's and they're colorful when they get them, right? I mean, there's dark. Most people never see them because they're down in the dark. But they're yes. colorful anyway. Um, you know, I don't think so. That's kind of my own take on them. That's, that's the artistic license in me. Well, I love it. You know, you could, I, I think if I, from apart from the teeth, I'd put it like in a toddler's bedroom or <laughs> I want to buy one of these, uh, actually, but I, I'm, I was, not all, of them, not all of them have scary teeth. Just okay. Like well, I'll look into that and then I'll buy one that, whose teeth don't frighten me uh, that, that red one in particular is just going to eat that heart so it's just such a real it's a it's a story in realism is what it is so well it, I used to do uh, valentine's cards for my uh, granddaughters to mm -hmm. you know to take to school I'd make prints of things and and I used to do a lot of mermaids and things as well and uh -huh. my <laughs> my granddaughter I could hear in the background saying well, grandma's going to do cards for me. Make sure they're appropriate. <laughs> I said, what do you mean appropriate? She's, Have you seen grandma's work? She, went, she puts boobs on everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. I mean, it is cool. They, they get to have an interesting grandmother. Uh, I had one too, but I won't go into that. This is yours. Oh, well, here we go. Well, I, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so on your the upper uh, left hand of your screen, the sea dragon, that is the last piece that I did prior to incarceration, uh, literally about a month, just a month before. And that piece is welded from 2,000 feet of steel, and it was 90 feet long and 18 feet tall, and those fins those big pink fins, those are 20 feet long right there. And I engineered it to float. And the whole thing is segmented. So it, so it articulates just like one of those little toy bamboo snakes that kids would hold the tail and it wiggles all around. Mm -hmm. And you could actually, well, we took it out in a volcanic pond before we took it to the Utah Arts Festival. And we sailed it around in this pond with my daughter inside. And it was just... It was so much fun. And um, that was actually my very first welding project. Does yeah. it still exist? I have no idea. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where it went to two different museums. And by then I was incarcerated. And like six months into my incarceration, you know, they called the jail and they're like, so we're done with your artwork. When can you come pick it up? <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm sure it's probably been, you know, melted down for scrap somewhere, you know, but these, this is the kind of thing that I'm going to be rebuilding out in the desert. Um, so it's going to be, I've already got quite a bit of steel. I've been accumulating steel every month 
and I've started building this giant fish, which is going to look a lot like the ones in those little pictures, only longer. And it's about 60 feet long and about 20 feet tall mm. right now. So I think at any rate, a picture of the skeleton of it. In a yeah. Bit, but I don't know where it is. So, but I just, you know, I love, I love the welding. It's just, you know, it's like the glue gun of the gods. Yeah. And you're making lava and it's, and it's just awesome. You know, I have to be careful not to set myself on fire on occasion, but other than that, you know, it's like my favorite thing in the world to do now, but it was, it was challenging though, when you're out in a rural area in Utah, they don't expect women to do things like that. So the first time I went in to try to buy steel, I had these, you know, the big fat guys in the overalls with no shirts, you know, tip back in their chairs, you know, and they're just ignore you. You know, and I'm in the store for like 45 minutes. And finally, I went up to the counter and I said, asked them if I could possibly order, you know, this certain amount of steel. And they just kind of looked at me and said, well, it'd probably be better if your husband came in and told us what he wanted. And I said, well, that would be awkward because he doesn't know how to weld. <laughs> so. I took it back to the store when they, uh, when I had it done and I had it all on the trailer and was taken and I made them come out the store and look at it because I didn't believe I'd be able to do that. And they were just like, God damn. <laughs> so it was pretty entertaining, but, um, at any rate, I'm really looking forward to getting back to doing all that because all my equipment was stolen obviously while I was in prison. And so I've been gradually replacing pieces bit by bit. And I'm just about to the point where I can really start working in earnest. Okay. So then underneath all these other pieces I built while I was in prison, I was in for about three years before I taught myself how to crochet. And I crocheted in a much different manner than most people did. Um, partially because I didn't understand it. And when somebody tried to teach me, I find after about three hours, I was like, okay, yeah, thanks. But I got it, you know, and went back to my cell and was just like, oh, geez, you know, <laughs> this is what, what did I get myself into? Uh, first of all, I've got math anxiety, so I don't count anything. And all I ever saw people doing when they crocheted was like counting and then cursing and tearing things out and, you know, redoing things over and over and over. And I thought, well, this doesn't look like any fun at all. And I wasn't interested in doing squares, you know, or giant rectangles or all that kind of stuff. I wanted to do you know, three-dimensional work and organic stuff. And so that night I had a dream about the salamander and I envisioned the salamander. And basically it was kind of like doing a contour drawing where if you have a three-dimensional object and then you just draw a line like all the way around it, you know, and that was, that was how my mind translated the, uh, the shape of the crochet form was doing that, making that contour. All those rows were just contour lines that I was drawing around a three-dimensional object that already existed in my head. So these pieces that you're seeing, these other pieces, these were all done at Wasatch, while I was at Wasatch uh, County Jail, where the officers were, for the most part, a lot more interested in letting people pursue uh, things that kept them out of trouble. And so they were, had a little bit more leeway as far as the yarn that I had and the tools that I had available to me. When I was at the, when I was at the prison prior, I actually bought a set of crochet hooks on the black market for $150 just so I could do the kind of work that I did because otherwise you had tiny tiny plastic hooks that just you know <laughs> 15 minutes in and you've broken them but there's a matrix so you're only allowed to buy one every 33 days and if you like she was saying if you wanted to do an art project at Utah State Prison if you wanted to crochet you had to put in a property contract 
And that had to be signed by the sergeant, the uh, captain, and a deputy warden and a lieutenant, I think. And so it could take anywhere from four to six months for you to get your property contract back, which allowed you to crochet something. And on that contract, you had to provide them with the receipts for the materials that you bought, your tools that you bought. Um, you had to specify exactly what you were making, how big it was going to be, how many colors. For some things, they actually regulated and said you could only have three colors. Like if you wanted to do a blanket or something, it could only have three colors in it. Um, and <laughs> so, and then in the midst of all this, while you're trying to save up materials to work with, you've got SWAT coming in every few months, just tearing everything up and throwing all your stuff away. And I had one instance where I had put together an exhibit um, for a charity project for the battered women's shelter. And I was working on six different pieces and I'd gotten permission to do it. And SWAT came in and just, you know, bagged all my stuff up and was hauling it out. And I protested and the, the uh, captain came in and I said, look, you know, I've got a signed property contract that allows me to do this and it's going to be shipped out in two weeks. You know, what is the issue? And he says, let me see your contract. I hand it to him and he just tears it in half in front of me and throws it on the floor. And he says, well, I've rescinded your contact contract. So bag up your stuff and throw it away. So that's the kind of thing I was dealing with, you know, very regularly. I, I think probably... Oh, I was lost you there for a second. Um, I think probably, I don't know, only about 45% of the work that I did actually made it out of the prison. Most of the rest of it was destroyed. And uh, it's like with my drawings, I had an officer say, you know, those are really nice drawings, but if you don't want them destroyed, make sure you store them in an envelope that looks like it's addressed and ready to go out. And that way they can't mess with it if it's, you know, in your mail. But if you just have them in a folder or in your notebook, they can take them and tear them up or do whatever they want. So at any rate, this, uh, the specific pieces on here, you've down underneath the, the dragon there's a chameleon um and that's done pretty realistically for its colors it actually has a red skin and then every scale on top of it is done individually um, and that's where the blues and the greens and then everything comes in and that piece is about oh gosh he's probably if you stretched out his tail he'd be about nine feet long wow. so he's he's a good three feet tall and his he has a skeletal structure that is indigent pencils all lashed together so that's what's helping him stand up see i couldn't do armatures at the prison i could only do those at the at the jail and um otherwise you know they they confiscate it the armadillo is also about probably about five feet long and about two and a half feet tall. Yeah. And then at, at the top of the page, there's a, um, a horny toad or a horned lizard. And he's as big as I am. You know, he's almost five feet long and about three feet across. And the iguana was made out, the iguana was made out of scraps. That was the first thing that I made when I first got to was transported to the jail for housing after, well, I'd spent, I guess I was in, I was at the prison from 2006 to 2014. And then an attorney tried to help me. And so they just whisked me away one day without telling anybody and left all my stuff, my legal files, everything left it all behind. And it was a big fight to even get back to someplace civilized. But, you know, it effectively disrupted, disrupted my uh, legal defense at that point in time. So when I got shipped off to this little teeny tiny jail, I mean, you're, you're talking 
60 people and half of them are females. And of those, maybe half of those females are state inmates and the other half county. And nobody knew where I was. I didn't have any resources. People were, when they get released, they'd throw their crochet projects in the trash. So I'd get them out of the trash, I'd wash them, and then I'd unravel them. And that iguana is made entirely out of, you know, thrown away scrap yarn. And he's about seven feet long. He's like life size for a full size iguana. And then there's the crawfish underneath that was kind of a, in honor of a lot of my friends in New Orleans. (laughs) And then this this last piece is actually a three-dimensional representation of a drawing that I did. That's part of a triptych that you'll see. Mm -hmm. And it's a self-portrait of me inside of a cell crocheting but the things that I'm crocheting it's turning into a vine and a and a flower that's blooming on the outside of the bars so you know it's just you've got me in here okay you know you you're imprisoning my body but my soul is going to make it out of this place through my artwork you know I still have a voice regardless Mm -hmm. so screw you guys No, I I think that's uh, also what our first speaker talked about, this kind of inviolable in in uh, space in, in violet space in, inside of you that nobody can touch that yep. yourself. If you're strong enough, I don't think everybody has it. And I I think you, uh, where how you got it, I have no idea, but I'm grateful that you did. Well, I think it's something that goes all the way back to childhood for me, you know, being in difficult situations Mm -hmm. and, you know, wanting desperately to feel safe and which is where all the scary things come into play is Mm -hmm. that's kind of like my kind of like my spirit animal, you know, armor between me and, and, and all the crap in the world. It's just this mental construct of something that keeps me safe. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that uh, metaphorically, that's brilliant. I mean, on your part as an individual and how you dealt with it. So, okay, I'm moving on, I think. (laughs) There we go. There's the triptych. Okay, so here's the triptych. And initially, the very first drawing that I did was a version of the first one. And that was when I was, I'd only been in jail for a couple of Uh, It was a few weeks at that point. And my situation had been that a, that a, basically a professional lifelong con artist had insinuated himself into my life. And later on, we found out that basically his game was to find women who had undergone some sort of tragedy that might have money and that were just kind of wool gathering, you know, it's like, you're not a, you don't have your wits about you when you're grieving. And so he would, he would plant himself in these women's lives and be helpful and sympathetic. And then he'd marry them and clean out their bank accounts and then they disappear. And so he'd been married like five times and all of those women are dead and they can't even find one of them. And he had bragged about killing people and getting away with it. Of course, I didn't know any of this, you know, at this point in time. But, you know, I fell into his pattern of, you know, I, I married him after a fashion and, um, you know, then things changed and he became very, very scary. And when he realized that I didn't have any money, actually, um, he was very angry about it. And... So I went through about a six month period that was, could only be described as as extreme mental and physical torture and being fearful of, you know, your children and your family's safety. I had a lot of animals at that point in time, Uh, did a lot of rescue work. And one of the things that he would do, well, he would kill my animals. And if initially it was just, I'd come home from work and I'd find something dead and didn't know why. And he'd make up some story about it. And and I didn't want to disbelieve him. You know, I, I wanted to believe what he was telling me, 
because it was too horrifying to imagine otherwise. But then I saw it happen with my own eyes when he didn't realize I was watching one day. And then I knew I was dealing with a straight up sociopath. And once he realized that I kind of had a clue, then he dropped all pretense of being kind or, you know, anything. And, you know, on a weekly basis, I was treated to things like having them gather up a nest of, of baby animals, chicks or ducklings or bunnies, and he doused them with lighter fluid and set them on fire in front of me and tell me that that's what would happen to my grandchildren if I tried to leave him. So, so I don't have any remorse for what I did other than I wish that the officers I had called multiple times had actually done their job. I wish somebody else had shot him and that I didn't have to, but I am thrilled that my children are all alive and my grandchildren are all alive and that they did not have to experience the horrific things that he had planned. So in that, in that vein, when I went to prison, um, when I was first incarcerated, especially, I was looking at a life sentence. You know, they were saying it was going to be a 25 to life and you know, domestic violence enhancement, handgun enhancement, all kinds of nonsense. Um, oh, what else? Uh, obstruction of justice. That was a good one, considering that I called the police myself and told them exactly what happened. So, you know, there was none of this, you know, trying to catch me. I didn't hide anything. I didn't, there was none of that. Um, so they had, they had to drop a lot of that. And I ended up with a, a one to 15 plea bargain, but this, this first one really illustrates how I felt at that point in time. I felt helpless, hopeless, completely immobilized, just in excruciating mental and physical pain, completely dehumanized. I'd never been strip searched before. You know, I didn't, I had no experience with that kind of thing. I was, I was just a mom, you know, with five kids, minding my own business, being an artist, living out on the land. Nothing in my past prepared me for this kind of experience. So, you know, that's a woman immobilized in pain. And basically she's, it, if you can zoom in, there's like little stick figures, kind of silhouettes of two children disappearing over the horizon as the sun oh, yeah. So it's like, you know, your hopes and dreams are, you know, they're, they're gone. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know how to zoom. I'm afraid I'll screw it up. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So then these, the last, the other two came kind of in the last third of uh, my incarceration. And the second one is, you know, that's, that's the drawing that that other, um, you know, three-dimensional piece portrayed. And it's where you accept the fact that you're there, that you're not getting out, that, you know, they don't care about justice. It doesn't matter, but you still have things to say. You still have things to communicate. You still have things to teach. And by God, you're going to get them out. So, you know, there's a feeling of defiance uh, to it. And the uh, lizard in there is kind of my it's like myself, my self comforting thing. It's like, I'll crochet myself some friends, you know, <laughs> and have my, my giant scary lizard will be or something to keep me company for a while. And usually I had to hide things in my bed or strap to the underside of other bunks while officers were doing their rounds. And then I wouldn't bring them out until they were completely done and ready to, you know, be shipped out. And then all of a sudden you you know, here on the intercom. Oh my God, what's that? Where did it come from? <laughs> it was kind of gratifying, you know, that was fun. So then the last picture is, uh, is uh, kind of when I'm getting ready to get out. I'm, it's, it was like five years before um, I thought I was going to be released. So I'm starting to seriously think, okay, you know, I need to start imagining the bars disappearing. 
I need to start really focusing on nurturing those goals and those dreams. And so, you know, it's like I said, you've got the protective outer scary fish shell, but then within, you know, there's the inner child that still, still believes in, in hope and dreams. And she's holding an embryo that she's cradling and she's keeping safe. And so, you know, that's, it just has to do with focus, you know, taking your spirituality, your intellect, whatever you've got to work with and really hanging on to that focus of who you are going to be when you get out, not who everybody thinks you're going to be, but who you know you are and who you want to be. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's amazing. Okay, so on this page, we've got, okay, so I'm going to start with the one, um, the fish house that's down, that's on the left hand, or excuse me, the right hand side. That's the piece that the state of Utah bought for their permanent collection while I was incarcerated, which cracked me up because technically they're not really allowed to do that. But because I was in a county jail, they weren't following the prison rules. So, and this was just, the reason why I built this piece is because I wanted to make myself a place to live that was, you know, kind of advertised what I did and it was just fun. I wanted my own little sanctuary. And so this was designed to be like a trailer that you could pull and then the mouth opened up to turn into like a porch. Now this piece, was all crocheted and I did it just for to show my children what I had in my head because when I tell them my ideas they're just kind of like oh, okay mom you know, <laughs> you're crazy whatever and I thought well maybe if they could see a three-dimensional rendition of it that they'd get excited about it too and maybe it could be like a family project or something maybe I could teach my granddaughters some some construction skills you know it could be something really fun so I made this and I gave it to them at one of um, our visits. Didn't really think anything else of it. Then an exhibit came up and I wanted to enter something. Didn't have time to get anything done that I wanted. Um, my daughter says, well, how about if I order, just put one of your old pieces in? She suggested this one and I said, no, I don't feel like it's professional enough for the venue. Well, she didn't listen to me and she entered it anyway, and it won best of show and then the state purchased it. So all total, it ended up being about, I think about almost $5,000. And that was all the money that I had when I got out. And that's what I purchased an RV and, you know, the other incidentals of life that you need when you first, first get out. Um, I mean, I could have maybe gotten an apartment somewhere with that, but I wouldn't have had an income to keep the apartment after the first month. So it didn't make any sense for me to make that kind of investment in something that wasn't actually mine. You know, I wanted tools. I wanted things I could build on. So that's, that's the history behind that piece. Oh, also another interesting thing was that there is some cardboard in the bottom of the structure to uh, hold it together, give it some structural integrity. And that was obtained because I was working, I was the commissary worker and we'd get deliveries at the back door where I worked. And one day a delivery is made and I look at it and it's a bunch of assault rifles. <laughs> and, you know, I'm hitting the button going, um, excuse me, I think there's some things down here that shouldn't be anywhere near me. <laughs> And they're like, oh my God, you know, so they came and collected up their assault rifles and it was for Homeland Security and they'd taken them to the wrong place, you know, but <laughs> meanwhile, I had a really sturdy, cool box that they left behind and I was unsupervised for a while. So I just went ahead and cut out all the structural support pieces that I wanted out of that. So <laughs> It, it has pieces of war in it, <laughs> made into something completely different. Now, <laughs> the top piece is called prison. It's a prison fish. And it's actually a 
it kind of looks like a, if you can see the whole thing, it's like a big fantail goldfish, but the interior is a replica of a prison cell. I mean, every single detail is in there. And the woman is, you know, wearing the Utah State prison whites and she has no face. You know, her face is just blank. There's no features. Her chest is torn open and she's holding her heart on the outside of the bars. Mm. And that really, you know, that had to do with being a mother and, and feeling, you know, the being dehumanized and, you know, just missing your children which so many women were going through there. And let's see, beneath that is the first studio configuration of all my yarn. I like brought about 75 pounds of yarn out of the jail with me <laughs> when I left. I had big, you know, the big bags, the laundry bags that, that you usually have your sweatpants and everything. Mine were full of yarn. So, I mean, that's all I had. I had my yarn, some crochet hooks and my sweatpants. That was it. That's what I walked out with. And I, some people had redone their kitchen and thrown away all the cabinetry. And so I reconfigured it inside the little trailer I was living in, um, out in the field. So that was last, that was about a year ago that I was in that space. Very cool. Very creative. It's amazing. Okay, so I'm going on, I guess. <laughs> I'm still looking, but yeah. Oh, here's the <laughs> land. Is this? <laughs> yes, yes. This is, so this is out in the desert about, in kind of in south central Utah. Um, it's about 45 minutes west of Cedar City, which is kind of on the main drag if you're going on I-15. But here was the thing. It's like, I have not been able to secure any kind of uh, traditional housing. And they've got rules down here that you can't have an old RV on in any of the RV parks. Can't be more than 10 years old. And my RV is from 1975. So it doesn't really... <laughs> fit their criteria so you know I kind of bounced around living in different fields and things here and there and people would let me stay in their yards and and then you know neighbors would complain or there'd be an ordinance or something and and then COVID hit and there was just I had no income stream anymore uh, to speak of I mean I've been I had been living on about five hundred dollars a month and so this whole time, my dream has been to have a piece of land to start building a studio on in some place that I could have kind of as a sanctuary and for both people and animals. And I, you know, so I've been looking at real estate the whole time I've been out, you know, just kind of like, you know, window shopping, basically. And I thought, well, maybe in another year or in a couple of years, you know, I'll be able to do something like this. Well, when I was confronted recently um, with knowing that I really didn't have any place to live and I was running out of options, I was looking at the land one night, it was about three o'clock in the morning, and I thought, well, here's 80 acres and the payments are only $250 a month. I can afford that. You know, I can't afford $1,500 a month for a stupid apartment that I can't do my artwork in, but I can sure as hell afford 250 bucks a month and go camp on it. And so that's what I did. I bought this piece of land and um, I just made my, my, second, <laughs> my second payment on it. And I have started putting together a structure using um, welded wire livestock panels. There's about 18 of them in the structure that you can kind of see right now. And these panels are 16 feet long and five feet um, tall. And so I've kind of got a bent like a hoop house. And at the end of the tail, there's just one panel um, in length that's, that's bent around. And then up towards the head, you've got a full two panels put together for the height. And then there'll be a big jaw that's open. And then I'm welding the tails and the fins um, pieces 
separately and attaching those. And and I'll build a structure on the inside so that I can have a loft, a sleeping loft up inside the head and do stained glass in the eyes. And let's see, I've got, I'm working on getting solar panels and um, trying to figure out what exactly I want to use for the surface of it. I'm kind of leaning towards doing some kind of a translucent, um, almost like resin surface with big crocheted scales embedded in it with some fiber optics to kind of mimic the bioluminescence that you see in deep sea creatures. And basically I'll be living in the head and my chickens will be living in the tail. And uh, they're kind of my, <laughs> I don't know if I'm their support animal or if they're my support animal, but um, they're very, very therapeutic to just go sit out with them. And, you know, there's always one that wants to just sit in my lap and talk to me or try to sneak and eat an earring or something. And plus I get eggs every day and they're just, they're just wonderful little creatures. And I seem to have accumulated a lot of roosters because people dump them. So I guess that's kind of the first part of my sanctuary is I guess I am adopting roosters that people discard. So this is, this is my dream right now is to turn this into something habitable and then also work on a, um, on the RV so that I can kind of take the message and take the classes and, and do collaborative work with other women um, across the country as soon as I'm off of parole, which will be July 27th this year. Yay. <laughs> okay, moving on then. Uh, and that's the fish house you're really going to live in with your chickens. I, that's amazing. Okay, <laughs> here we go. And you have to live outside, which I think is ideal. You know, people used to live outside. So they did. They did. And it's, I mean, it's completely off the grid. Mm -hmm. I have to haul water in. Um, I just found a 500 gallon tank that I can, that I can get. And, uh, you know, it's like solar water tank, haul water and have a litter box. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they like to call them composting toilets. Let's not fool ourselves. They're just litter boxes for people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So these are all drawings that I did. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I don't know what I did. Um, <laughs> Oh, I went the wrong direction. Can I fix it? Yes. Sorry. There we go. There we go. These, um, except for the one all the way on the, on the right, these are all drawings that I did while I was at the prison, actually. And, you know, two of them are just happy mermaid fish pictures. And the other two or when I was in a therapy class and the teacher said, well, you're an artist. Why don't you draw how you feel? <laughs> so I did. And she said, oh, you don't feel very good, do you? And I was like, no, <laughs> I do not. <laughs> so, so tell us about the head on that guy. What's the deal with him? The guy that's, that's prying his head open. That's oh, that's a guy. Oh, head. no, I meant the other one with all the. Yeah, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to hear more about those if you want to tell us. Okay, well, um, let's see. That particular one was the playpen. See, he's in a steel playpen, which, right. you know, that's, that's basically what prison is like, a steel playpen. Um, you know, there's not much to keep you occupied. They treat you like a child. It's, uh, you know, and, and there's no, there's, well, I'm speaking for the Utah State Prison specifically. There's, there's nothing to stimulate your mind. You know, there, there weren't really any classes or if they did have classes, they were so regulated that it was hard to get into them. And most, pretty much everything was geared to a third to fifth grade level. And 
you know, and I understand the importance of that, but there also needs to be something more for people that are ready to progress past that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they just actively um, dismiss and discourage any kind of, you know, thought process or, so it's kind of like, you, you know, you're in this infantile environment and you just get so, people get so frustrated because they've got all this stuff going on in their, in their head, whether it's emotional distress or, or, you know, things they want to fix about themselves or questions they have about their upbringing or things they want to do for the future. And you just, you've got so much more in your head than you have space for. So that's why he's like, he's like tearing apart, tearing open the top of his head and trying to just let all this stuff out. That's, that's building up all this pressure. Mm. And let's see the one next to it has to do with you know, marriage and trust and abuse and, you know, trying to keep your baby safe and, you know, and, and just feeling dead inside after a while, because, you know, it just erodes with the erosion of your self-worth and your self-esteem and just everything about who you are. And yet, you know, the men that I knew and that the women that I knew, knew, it's like they were so good at not showing their face to the public. You know, it's all behind closed doors. They put on a good front. Um, you know, it's like my first husband was a was a professor at a university. And in social situations, you know, he would behave himself. And everybody would think, oh, everything's great. But then you know, you go home and you're getting bounced off the walls to the point where you're miscarrying and people don't believe you because, oh, somebody, you know, professional person like that and blah, blah, blah. They would never, you know, they would never treat somebody that way. So, you know, it's just such a cultural thing that men get away with. And, you know, we, we just have to be more aware and support each other more when, you know, people are trying to let you know what's really happening. And that was, you know, especially when you're like in, in rural areas where there's, there's really no support system for domestic violence. We don't have any shelters, you know, there's nothing, nothing at all. And when you call the cops, they usually don't do anything. You know, my, my last husband, he, I would have been beaten and tied up and you know, tortured and just everything that you can imagine. And he would flee the scene. The cops would go find him and they'd give him a ride home and tell him, you know, how sorry they were that he was married to such a bitch that would call the cops on him and that maybe I should just be a better wife. And when my case was going on in the, in the media, the prosecutors actually said that it may have been self-defense, but what we will never know is what she must have said to provoke the need to defend herself. So that's the kind of domestic violence climate I was dealing with back when my case was going on. Now, I've seen it change considerably in certain areas, but when you get out into these little provincial patriarchal spots, you know, it's still bad. So that's, that's what that picture is all about. And just, just the devious nature of, and the secretive nature of dealing with domestic violence that people don't see. Uh, let's see, the other two pictures are just mermaids enjoying their fish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the other, the thing on the very end, which you really can't see very well, um, I was a foreman over the silkscreen shop for a period of time. And instead of throwing away the rags that we cleaned the screens with, I kind of, I, I rinsed them out and they had all these cool colors in them. And then I just did, I printed on top of them. So I was printing on top of, um, you know, cleaning rags. And that was, that was a fun 
project in recycling. Of course, it all got taken away, but <laughs> it was fun while it lasted. Looks like a sort of yin yang with a hole in the middle. Yeah, it is. It's two fish and it's and it is kind of a yin yang thing. It's or a Pisces symbol or you know, it's I was just playing with I'm playing with uh, images that I had made. Yeah, I love it. It's haunting. It's different from everything else. 